Um, we're a very large family, uh, seven boys and three girls, um, all very close together in ages, um, and but all different personalities, but we all get along really good. We had a lot of fun as kids. We lived in a sort of a semi-rural area. There wasn't uh, a lot of built up areas and we had woods and fields and stuff that we could run in and it was quite secure. We didn't have enough budget to uh, arrange a holiday having so many children. But we were happy to go for a day somewhere, maybe to the nearest village or to a relative and spend the day there. That was a, as good as a holiday for us. My favourite childhood memories was probably um, when we used to play uh, in the woods at making swings um, where we were, we'd all play out together. Favourite childhood memories? My earliest one is uh, I used to go to the movies with my mother. She was a movie buff and she'd take me along because no one was looking after me. And I can still recall these movies in my head and I've seen them since. Another memory is uh, we used to have a, a Friday afternoon ritual. My father would bring home a basket of groceries and goodies for the household for the weekend. And that was sort of a highlight or everyone got a chance for a decent feed for once. The majority of my childhood memories were playing out, outdoors with loads of friends because we lived in a park and my siblings and I clearly remember a wooded area opposite our house and it was called the walks and it was like a forest with rivers and nice walking areas and you know, saw the odd squirrel and loads of birds and stuff and it just you could have spent all day just playing there. For me school was a bit of a disaster to begin with I mean I'd been at home with my mother for five years on a unbroken and um all of a sudden I was thrown into this school with kids and adults everywhere and noise and my mother was to leave me there and I ended up screaming and kicking and kicking the shins off the headmaster and generally being a naughty boy. I could never settle at school for some reason. I think primary school was a chore for me and I never really looked forward to it apart from the time off during the day. I didn't really think the primary school teachers had a lot of time for me. There's a lot of class distinction in those days and if you didn't have much you were sort of uh, become a, irrelevant. Uh, they're more concerned about the farmers daughters and the businessmen's sons. Although during my teens I did do well. I got a couple of high marks before I left and I was quite pleased with that. School was great, um, high school, well intermediate school you called it, um, there was a few canings going on there but I mean everyone got it and you couldn't avoid it because you were just get caught up maybe with the wrong people and you just misbehaved but all in all both schools were very nice and teachers, teachers were very nice. Could you explain the 12? So the 12th of July is what's called um, Orange Day in Northern Ireland, is um, when King Billy won the Battle of the Boyne. King William was fighting for religious and civil liberties for all. On the 12th, we always got new clothes, and the new clothes always had to have red, white and blue in them and would wave our flags watching the orange and the bands all passing. It was it was always something we really look forward to. 12th of July uh, to us as children was a big day, fun, music, lots of people, ice cream, and it was the middle of the summer, which was an important time during the summer holidays from school. To us, it was nothing political. It was just watching these people marching, music playing, and 
generally it was fun, a fun day. Just everyone looked forward to that day each year. Um, when my two uh, younger brothers joined a, a flute band, then as the four younger ones grew up, they joined it as well. And it had got really very exciting because they were all in the band. My father was a, a bandsman. I remember him practicing when I was a young boy. And then he gave it away. And then when my brothers got old enough, they became uh, bandsmen themselves. And my dad took an interest in it. The 11th night, there was a bonfire. Everybody celebrated that. And that went on until the 12th morning. Um, I was 14 when the troubles first started. Uh, it was quite of a shock, really, seeing it on TV and on the news. On the news. Um, our area was quite quiet, but I remember seeing the police coming home in the evenings after being involved in riots and they'd be injured and be blood on their uniforms and coming off a bus. And it was very frightening to see that and thinking, what were they doing? And my parents would always talk in the evenings of what is happening and what's going on and commenting. But at 14, he didn't really understand a lot of what was going on. My first memory of the Troubles was seeing makeshift barricades in all our streets, soldiers patrolling the streets and tanks, army tanks. My first memory was um, in our small town there was a uh, barricades put up to stop traffic, people coming in, people going out, um, uh, men dressed in um, sort of army gear with uh, balaclavas on um, and there was petrol bombs in our local town, there was uh, the ch local chapel got bombed and um, one of the uh, petrol stations. Dear, the first memory, well, there was, it was on the news when I was uh, early teens, but then when I left school, I got a job in a solicitor's office and they sent me to Belfast to do some bookkeeping training. And that was the early 70s and that's when Belfast was rife with bomb scares, bombs going off. You had to get your bags checked every shop you went into and it was like one one day a week we had to leave our offices and go to the very bottom of Chichester Street and wait for the bombs to be defused and sometimes the bombs went off and that wasn't quite the way it was supposed to be but that's what happened and it was a bit scary. It affected our town because it, it stopped people coming in coming in to visit. There were certain shops that wouldn't open so we couldn't go and get shopping. Um, it was quite scary where there was maybe bonfires across the road. Um, sort of made everybody be a little weary about their everyday life. Um, examples of uh, how it affected the local village. Um, there was no parking in the area. You weren't allowed to park anywhere in the town centre. Uh, because they were parking cars with explosives in them and then exploding up and, and blowing up the city. So in the local towns and villages, they weren't uh, permitted to park anywhere near shopping areas. And the local police stations were fortified to protect them from rockets and explosives and bullets, which was unusual. And people always had a sense of wariness. What if something was going to happen that day or you know, the unpredictability of what's going on. When the Loyalist strike came, um, Donegal was affected slightly because the paramilitaries stopped the buses, they controlled the shops, told them when to open, when to close. There was queues everywhere, there was rations on the food and milk and it was quite hard. And when I, when I went to Bangor to work, when I eventually was able to get through the barricades to get to Bangor, then I had to queue up for food for my mum to bring it home on my lunch hour and it was, it, it was a bit scary and a bit stressful for our parents. Where did you grow up? I grew up on the Shanko Road in Belfast. It was bombing and shooting in your area. There was men patrolling in the garden, the streets. 
and fear of attacks from the IRA and also going to school our school bus had to pass a Catholic area and on a regular basis our bus windows were put in and we just went on into school as normal on return journey they had to put special school buses on again buses were smashed and it just it was just normal well the IRA came into the area the bombed shops and pubs killing innocent men, women and children. The IRA also came in and shot people in their own homes. And then most most nights there was renting between Protestant and Catholics and that was ju just a matter that was just a matter of course and in interface areas. Was it scary? Yeah, it was scary. Um, even though our area wasn't the flashpoint, it was still scary that when you were thinking of something that might happen and could happen, you're always a little bit frightened. Yeah. No, because um, we sort of knew the people that were involved, and we because it just happened gradually. It was just something that we were used to. I was scared for my, my daughter and my uncles in case they were shot. Yes, uh -huh. as, as the months and years went on, it was very frightening. And just, there was a chance that you could have got caught up with the wrong person at the wrong time and you just had to be very careful who you spoke to and made sure you didn't speak to the people that you thought were involved in paramilitaries, you just had to keep your self to yourself. Um, something that was normalised and realised afterwards it wasn't common yet. Yeah, I think the general news every day there was a shooting, every day there was a bombing, and we thought that was normal for a news bulletin. And of course, you listen to the news today, it's a big thing of a shooting or a bombing, and you think, well, you know, when we were younger that was a normal thing to hear on the news each day. Things like obviously religion, um, n not speaking to people of the opposite religion. Um, probably for my older siblings, they would would say um, such and such a family of Catholics. Um, you know, we're separate from them, but that's just because we didn't know any different. That's how we were brought up. That's how it was in the seventies. Well, there was a few things. More, more of them would probably be the riots every night. We just went up stood and watched. And then you come back, you realise that you thought it was normal at the time, but now you realise that it's not normal. And also, maybe you went into the city centre and you wondered, are you going to get caught up in a bomb? How long do you have in the city centre before there's a bomb scar? And you have to come home. And then you're sitting in, at home and you think to yourself, who's going to get shot in my street tonight? Well, growing up through the 70s, there was an unnecessary hatred towards Catholics. And this did cause a lot of friction and unrest through the years. Although I did have a few Catholic friends who were very, very close. But you were always wary that if your other Protestant friends saw you with Catholic friends, you would have got names. I joined the army when I was 18, when I became of age uh, to join. Um, I went in because I, I really wanted to help or to do something to try and help the situation that was going on around us. Well, my expectations were I felt I could make a difference, you know. I, I joined thinking I could help and make a difference. I felt I could show our locals in the area wanted to help. Of course, I also wanted some structure in my life, being, you know, 18, 19. And I hoped to achieve a lot of things in the military, which I did. I did. I, I was uh, quite 
impressed with how I achieved everything when I was in there. Um, positioning in Northern Ireland for me was, it wasn't that unusual. I mean, um, it's not uncommon having soldiers from Northern Ireland in the British Army. In fact, out of the 52 regiments, there's five Irish regiments, but only one, of course, is allowed to serve in Northern Ireland, or was allowed to serve, because of the obvious reasons. I was in a regiment that was allowed to serve, and many Northern Ireland people did serve in regiments that were permitted to serve there. And others from uh, Northern Ireland became good friends in other regiments, and you had English, Scottish, Welsh, sometimes Australians, Canadians, and it was all sort of quite a friendly atmosphere, and nobody really was concerned about where you were from. And um, I made some good friends, and well, I was a good friend to a lot of people. Looking back now, how do you feel about the reasonings behind the Troubles? Well, actually, I think they were they were quite silly um, fighting because you're, you're one religion and another when, as it's proven now, you can live together quite normally, quite happily. Looking back, I see the Catholics were wrong. They felt there was no jobs, no money, no housing. Well, I grew up in an area where there was no jobs, no money, no housing, deprivation. So I grew up exactly the same way as the Catholic girl. The reasonings behind the Troubles, I still see it as a historical tribal um, conflict, if you like, and each tribe wishing to dominate the other and punish the other for historic atrocities that, you know, can never be fixed. So it's uh, sad that they have this memory of the hatred and it's handed down from generation to generation. I think it's an, er an era that's very complicated and the bitterness still lingers at times. I've seen some English documentaries where the documentary makers seem to believe the IRA propaganda machine believing they were freedom fighters, but they were really murderers. The media got it right most of the time, but there were times when the brutality allegations were exaggerated and sometimes not true. And propaganda, I think, was the cause of that. But overall, they were reasonably accurate. However, they did have to sell a story, so they would sort of pat it out a little bit. Yeah. Yes, obviously some of them are accurate, but most of them are not. And it's normally people will look at the bigger picture and they never look at the, the sort of the smaller areas. It was mainly, mainly Belfast would be the um, ones they'd report on, Belfast, Londonderry. Well, I think, in my view, the majority of the politicians were constantly argumentative, but I believe they should have been trying to reach a peaceful solution earlier on. Um, dramatisation did play a part as far as the media were concerned and they revelled in front page headlines in the local papers. Attitudes, yeah, they've changed. People have enjoyed the peace for the last 20 odd years and not a lot remember uh, how it was because uh, they may not have been born then. The communities, however, tend to hold on to the old stories and hand down the um, stories of what has happened in the Troubles and they're determined not to let the young people forget about things that were done that they didn't agree with. Other shoes ha haven't really changed. Unionists wants to be part of the United Kingdom. Nationalists are doing their best to force the Unionists and the United Ireland. Oh, they've changed um, a lot. Um, there's never any question of what religion you are or what God you believe in, anything like that. There's, um, you know, there's, there's everybody's friendly to each other. 
um, and everybody lives together. The changes are for the better now, I think. People want to forget the past and move forward. And since the peace process this has encouraged the people of Ulster and brought back normality in a sense. What do you think changed that has allowed both communities to live together? The only thing that has changed for both communities is they can socialise together because there's no threats, there's no threats of bombs and shooting. But as regards education, they're still educated separately and they're still segregated in the housing. I think people just really got fed up, got fed up with what was happening and the amount of people that were dying. And I think the Good Friday Agreement uh, made a big, big difference. Um, so yes, I think politicians getting involved um, did help. Uh, I think the younger generation are mixing more and I think the integrated schools has, has helped out for the senior pupils and the fact that the Good Friday Agreement has made such an impact overall. Has it changed communities? Yeah, well they, they've learned to live together. They've had normality for so long that has developed and become a normal. Um, They've been able to talk to each other and communicate more than what it used to be. And therefore they understand each other a bit better, I think. Will it stay that way? Uh, I hope so, but I don't really know. Due to problems with um, Brexit and people, some people wanting a united island, do you think that this could spark more violence and there could be you know, another version of the Troubles in you know, a couple of years' time? I, I personally don't think so because I think the people of Northern Ireland are, are so ready and, and, and have been for many years to sit down around the table and talk rather than um, use violence and disrupt people's lives and people's towns. So no, I, I don't think it'll, it'll ever be another uh, time like that.